Welcome again for our last talk before lunch. Um, Jake Holes is going to talk to us about the security options for containers. Oh, cool. Hi, I'm here to talk about security options for containers. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour um, about what you can do to patch in a bit of security to containers and uh, what you should be looking for in existing container implementations to uh, see if they're secure. So uh, a bit about me first. Um, I run Dogger.io where uh, I'm trying to document all the low level features of containers in case you ever want to go and write your own containers. Uh, or container stack. Um, it's a lot simpler than most people would think. Uh, if you can fork, it's, um, that's about all you need to know um, to be able to pull something like that off. Um, on Twitter, I am follow or I am container dog. So uh, if you like what I uh, talk about here, please think about following me. And uh, shout out to Anchor for uh, sending me out um, to speak. Um, I wouldn't be here without them. So uh, let's get into it. Um, the <laughs> These days, there's a, w a much w wider variety of uh, the type of people that are going to attack you. Um, it, in the old days, it used to just be uh, botnets and script kitties. And I tend to find that uh, these days their requirements match those of my customers in that they want access to the customer's data. So does the customer. Uh, they want a bit of storage and CPU. And to protect against those sort of threats, you really need application level security. Uh, OS level security isn't going to really cut it. But uh, the, these higher level um, attackers, the uh, organized crime, um, ha general uh, activists, and uh, NSA level uh, or government threats, they've got a lot more um, skill, they've got a lot more time and effort they can use into attacking you, and they tend to want to move vertically. So they're, they're more than willing to attack a different customer on your hardware and then jump into a different, um, and use that to uh, attack other customers on your kit. And so they're more the type of uh, attackers uh, the thing, security frameworks I'll be uh, showing off here today are uh, helpful for um, preventing. So uh, what is security? Um, I've probably got a more concise form there. I think it's important to define it. Basically, it's about retaining administrative access to the box. Uh, you want to be able to both detect that your box has been attacked and um, continue to administer the box so that you can try and remove that threat. Um, it's in this case, you also want to restrict um, knowledge of other containers, so you don't want other customers knowing um, about having a full list of the other customers on the box. Um, I think that's fairly important. Now, uh, Unix has always had a whole lot of security features built into it that are useful. You're probably going to be f familiar with a lot of the subsystems on the left and might have used some of the stuff on the right. Um, a lot of the, this uh, is user-focused, as a Unix security model was user-focused. Um, however, containers throw uh, a bit of a wrench into the works here in that a container uh, ca can be or have multiple users here. So th there's some subsystems up there that actually don't work very well in a um, security context. Um, quotas are probably the classic example here in that as you've got multiple users, um, and quotas allow you to limit the disk um, allocated to a single user, uh, several users in a container can actually collude to uh, exceed the limit of a single one and thereby fill up the disk. Um, blacklisting via ACLs is also very, very similar. If the, uh, can, you know, if the container um, and the people in the containers have the ability to swap between different UIDs, then blacklisting a single UID is definitely not going to be effective. And I found that there's nothing really that useful in our limits that's uh, helpful in containers. There's much better subsystems, as I'll go into later on, that are useful for um, providing similar features there. So capabilities. Um, these are what capabilities look like. This is actually a list of capabilities that are not very useful in a container context. Um, probably uh, one of you might be familiar with is Cap make node, which is the ability to cre create device nodes. Um, capabilities were basically a way to, on an attempt to cut down root into smaller uh, bundles of authority that you could parcel out to both processes and files. Uh, and unfortunately, that backfired a bit. Uh, there's a capability known as cap sysadmin that's heavily overpowered and is almost a god capability. Um, but these are generally not. Uh, these are capabilities you definitely don't want, or you most likely don't want in a container. Uh, Mac override, for example, would allow you to turn or override 
uh, mandatory access controls such as SE Linux or AppArmor, and you really don't want the ability to turn that off inside a container if you're using that to protect the container itself. Uh, make node can be pretty dangerous. Um, if someone creates a make uh, creates a node for the root for, um, for where the root file system lies and mounts that file system and then starts making changes to it, um, then that could allow them to escape the container. So you definitely don't want that. And you tend to find that most of the capabilities you don't want to do in a container have to do with low-level management uh, of the box, uh, such as dealing with the devices. So it's fairly easy to track down which ones you don't want. Um, and at the very least, it's a very, very cheap and easy thing to patch in. Um, the uh, most containers have uh, an entry point, which is an init system or an application itself. And instead of calling that directly, you can just call uh, cap shell, which allows you to drop these capabilities and prevent them from being gained again. Um, so yeah, once again, very, very easy to patch in. Uh, very easy way to add a bit more security to your traditional container system. Um, you might want to just be careful that um, set pcap does allow you to actually fiddle with uh, capabilities, so you definitely want to be dropping that one as well. Um, and if you're doing to, trying to drop capabilities by hand, um, make sure you drop that one last, as if you drop that first, you can no longer drop any other further capabilities, which caused me to tear my hair out for a hair out for a very, very long time. Um, C groups. Uh, th this is not traditionally a subsystem you'd think of as security. But uh, if you're trying to retain administrative control to a system, uh, this is of vital importance. Um, the ability to account for resource usage and track down what CPUs in your system is vitally important. But probably the most important one here is uh, tracking of processes. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever dealt with an Apache process where a PHP process has decided to um, fork off a worker um, and it's no longer the, and that worker is dub uh, double forked and is now the parent of it is int rather than um, Apache. Um, if the workers or if Apache is inside a C group, it's very, very easy to um, track down that errant uh, process as the process itself can never escape out of the C group unless you've explicitly reassigned it. Um, so using C groups to uh, bundle together a group of processes and track them collectively is of uh, vital importance there. Um, one of the other lesser known features is it can actually block um, device access or give much more fine grain access to devices, which if you need to grant access to a real physical hardware device dynamically, um, this is a great way to do it. And um, in the case of um, uh, make node with the capabilities, you might think that's enough, but if you've got customers bringing their own file system images and the device nodes already on the file system, um, then it's very easy for them to just put a device node for the root file system and access it that way. <coughs> so you're really going to want to layer up um, in that case and um, also use C groups to restrict access to devices. Um, it is actually implemented as a file system and it looks a bit like this. Um, I don't have a cursor here, but uh, do I? Yes, I do. Um, so the tasks file here uh, just contains a list of PIDs, and these are the PIDs that are tracked inside the container. Um, if you want to add a process into uh, the C group, you just echo its PID into the tasks and suddenly it'll be tracked. Um, here I've shown an example of what the devices.list, which is uh, the allows you to see all the access policies for all the devices on the system. Um, the A there stands for um, Oops, all, device, all devices, but can be B for block or C for character. Um, and this just allows access to any major or any minor device. So as you can see here, I've granted uh, read, write, and make node um, for everything, for everyone, which as this is the root C group, uh, is probably a good idea because I want my UDEV to be able to create my device nodes. But um, on other systems, you might find there's a lot more um, uh, other files in here, uh, such as uh, CPU counting ones to see how much CPU time has been used, or CPU share to actually limit um, how many uh, CPU slices per second a process can get, um, as well as some memory accounting ones, which are also very handy. For, sorry, very handy for tracking memory usage for the container as a whole. Um, this is gen patching this in to an existing container solution is a bit harder, but uh, nearly every container solution I've seen has C group support out of the box. 
Um, if you do have to patch something like this in, just where you've got your spin int, uh, you want to replace it with a wrapper script that just echoes into the um, uh, the tasks folder. The only caveat there is that the C group file system might not actually be exposed to the container. So you might have to pause and somehow communicate out of band your PID and have that done, which complicates things. But as I said, most container implementations rely on this functionality anyway, so it shouldn't be something you have to patch in. Um, instead, you can just focus on the devices, limiting access um, to raw devices with the devices.list. Um, the next sub, well, the next two subsystems are the uh, Linux security modules, uh, AppArmor and SE Linux. I don't have, really have much to say um, about one versus the other. Uh, they're both great. You should be using uh, one or the other if you've got containers on your system. Um, which one you use is probably more dictated by your distribution choice and what actually works. Uh, if you can use SE Linux, I highly recommend it, as I'll get into in the next couple of slides. It brings a couple more things to the table. Um, however, uh, AppArmor is just as good, however it's more focused on protecting uh, the host system from containers rather than protecting containers from each other. Um, the, if you have a moment and you're interested in these sort of sorts of attacks, you can actually launch from a container against the host system. I highly recommend going and grabbing the LXC source code and having a look at the AppArmor policy. Uh, it's quite easy to read, but it makes you realize just how much damage you can do with access to the sys file system. Um, echoing stuff into the right file in there can cause lots of damage to the host system. So, um, yeah, let's talk about SE Linux a bit. Um, SE Linux can also, is also used to protect the, uh, the system from a malicious container, but it can also be used to uh, help prevent data leakage from one container um, into another container. Um, when most people think about uh, security, um, they st start to think about uh, unclassified, secret, and confidential. That corresponds to the multi-level security. I actually haven't found or seen a use for this um, in day-to-day -day usage with um, SE Linux uh, for protecting systems, and I generally try to ignore it. Um, however, the multi-category security is very useful in the, con in the context of containers. So uh, SE Linux in itself is probably about three separate uh, security frameworks. You've got your multi-level security. The other one is known as type enforcement, which is what's used to um, prevent the host system from being attacked by a container or um, one process attacking another. And this is where you tag some files on the file system as belonging to uh, Samba and others to Apache. And you say Apache, unless there's a rule to specifically allow Apache to talk to Samba, that access is blocked. <laughs> Um, but the extra features that SE Linux adds uh, to um, containers compared to uh, AppArmor is this multi-category security. So you can actually tag a container um, as belonging to the category, say, NSA or category ASIO. And even if a file is copied from the uh, NSA container into the ASIO container, um, because it's tagged with the NSA, it's going to block access. Um, it's sort of like polyinstantiation for um, security frameworks, and it's just something that, uh, unfortunately, AppArmor doesn't have. Uh, it's a very, very powerful feature. Uh, this is uh, actually something that um, QM, QMU, or oh, sorry, libvirt uses uh, as part of their SVirt framework. So every virtual machine gets its own um, security context. Um, if you have a working um, libvirt setup, uh, then this should. Um, Everything you need should be in place in terms of the policy. Uh, this does need a working SE Linux setup, and after trying to get something like that set up uh, as a live demo for this conference, I realized it's not something you can do overnight and requires a bit of uh, knowledge. So um, you'd have to put a bit of time into getting that working or uh, get libvirt installed with svirt. Um, a security context looks a bit like that. S0 corresponds to the unclassified and can generally be ignored. And then you've got the um, the tags C1 and C4, which might uh, correspond to NSA or ASIO in this case. And you tag the files with just a chicon um, command. Um, and then runcon is what you uh, use as your entry point. So you have runcon switched to the pr appropriate uh, security level and then inv invoke your um, uh, standard init system or entry point. So once again, relatively easy to patch in. Um, but there's quite a bit of setup work to um, initially get that up and running. 
Um, finally, the SIC comp. Um, this is a great uh, framework that's sort of like a firewall for syscalls. Um, unfortunately, it's not something you can patch in after the fact. It really requires um, uh, container uh, support from your container framework. But there's a lot of uh, syscalls can generally be divided into two um, classes: uh, device and systems management, and what I'd call user space. So user space would be open, read, write, create, socket. Um, and the management, um, I've listed a couple of calls that I'd consider management there. Uh, adjusting the time for the clock, uh, set in S allows you to jump between namespaces, which is effectively a container. Um, you generally don't want that inside of a container if you're trying to prevent access or jumping around between containers. Um, swap on and swap off, that's really not the responsibility of the container, that's but the um, and the outer system that's running everything, so you generally want to disable that. But uh, SecComp has the um, nice feature in that it's ultra ultra fine grain. You can actually filter on the arguments to the sys syscall itself. So in the case of a socket, you can make it so that it uh, only allows sockets of um, I of type IPv4 or IPv6 or Unix um, to be opened. Um, so you can actually grant much finer access to the to kernel resources um, than, say, the security frameworks presented on earlier pages. Um, it does. You do have to compile and load a, a policy, um, but, <coughs> uh, and that's why you do need fra um, support from your container framework in that regard. Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, the only one there that you really can't patch in after the fact is SecComp. It does give you quite a bit of extra security. Um, there was a vulnerability, for example, uh, in Echonet back in 2010, um, where if you created a socket of type Echonet um, and then did the right things with it, uh, you could gain root. And SecComp would have allowed you to um, only allow create IPv4 or Unix sockets um, and protect against that. But the rest of these um, security features can be patched in with a tiny bit of work if you do want to secure an existing uh, framework. Uh, sorry, existing container solution. Um, I highly recommend SE Linux, as I said before. Um, the more I've played with it, the more I like. Um, but if App Armor is available, definitely go with it. If you're trying to assess the security of a container solution, um, they might, might bring in their own custom security stuff that uh, is all good and nice. However, you generally want them to support at least two, any two from that list. Um, just so that you know that they're using the extra features of the Linux kernel um, to help keep everything secure. Um, and these are all battle-tested technologies. Um, if they're not using something like this, there's uh, avenues for attack that might not, uh, that can't necessarily be protected against from the, uh, the container framework. Um, so that's generally it. Uh, I did promise a whirlwind tour, and I hope it gives you a rough idea of what it can do to secure a container. Um, were there any questions? We've got a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone's got questions. The obvious ones being that Docker sort of gives you root on the container is pretty much root on the host. How big a difference to the security do you think getting the user mode version of that finally out to the public will make? Can you run that second part by me again? Um, in LXC natively, you, you can run it completely as a non-privileged user. Yeah. Docker currently doesn't give you that. Do you, do you feel like there's additional security in what Docker provides over LXC itself to make using Docker with user mode, which is mm. not possible yet, and a, a worthwhile thing to pursue? Um, as far as I'm aware, Docker's position has always been you don't have, you don't ever you make or run anything as root inside the Docker container. Um, I think that's rather valid for their use case. However, I think in LXC, for example, if you're trying to emulate it more like a full system rather than just protect a single application, you are going to have to um, hand out root. Um, 
the, there's no good answer here. Um, it's always going to be a bit of whack-a-mole. Um, if you are going to have do full containers and grant root, you are going to have to probably do at least three of those um, subsystems just because um, they all overlap to some degree and I consider that to be the minimum necessary to protect the system. Um, but yes, you're always going to be vulnerable to root inside a uh, container taking out the system because of something you haven't thought of. Um, and I can't see a good way structurally to prevent that. Um, I, that's answered your question. Uh, so you mentioned the SACOM there. Uh, do you see any container implementations like Docker or uh, Rocket or any of them um, having support for SACOM or Capsicum sandboxing in place at this point or in future? Um, possibly, and I hope so. Um, LXC, I would like to give a really, really big shout out to uh, because they've supported all of this from day one. Uh, they've basically done the security right. Um, and up until recently, Docker was nothing, as far as I'm aware, was nothing but a very, very thin wrapper around LXC with most of the security features turned off. Um, and they've now gone off and re-implemented libcontainers, which is great, except they've thrown all the security out and are going to have to re-implement it. Um, I would like to see them implement SecComp. I think there is a lot of benefit to it. Um, I mean, there's always going to be privilege escalation bugs, and if those privilege, privilege escalation bugs are not uh, namespace aware, they're going to get root inside the container, and you still want to try and protect against that, and that's where SecComp really comes into its own. There, it can help limit the attack surface um, to get root and pivot to other containers and that sort of thing. So I hope they do bring it in. Um, it's not particularly difficult, it's just I think they're going to have to find the time and uh, get it done. And it's kind of a shame that they abandoned LXC in that regard. Okay, please join me in thanking Jay for his talk.